Got 20 seconds. I'm on a man to go. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Good. Get those knees up. Explode. Good. Explode. Let's go. Up. Rock four. Let's go. One more. Go. This is the Fight Straight Podcast. NSFW on Breaking Muscle. Hello again, my fighting and fitness fans, and welcome to a new edition of the Fight Strength Podcast NSFW on Breaking Muscle. I am Jason Burgos, contributor to for both SureDog and MMASucker.com, and of course, I am joined once again by the very busy and very bearded traveling strength and conditioning grandmaster of American Top Team, Phil Duro. Phil, what is going on? Good evening, Jason. Oh, I like that. I like it. You like that. So I, I, I listen. I've been I've been listening to a lot of Jocko Willink, and uh, that's how they that's how they start the show. So oh, there's okay. good evening. They're very refined. I, I, very I respect refined and appreciate refined. Yes. So, so yeah, I'm good. But anyways, I'm good. I'm good. Um, <laughs> it's been a long day. It's been a long day, like always. But it's yeah. all good. I enjoy. My I enjoy my life. I enjoy what I do. So it's not a it's not a long and grueling day. It's just a long day, and uh, a lot of things going on, man. I'm super busy. Mm-hmm. That's why we haven't been doing a lot of podcasting um, recently. But I mean, we got them out. We got FSP yeah, overtime. Doing that, that, was, stuff, that wasn't you know? bad. Yeah, we're still we're still on it. We're mm-hmm. still good. We got a lot of good guests coming up mm-hmm. in the near future. Also, one that we have on tonight, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of big things also want to go ahead and preface that, you know, our ebook is still out. Mm -hmm. You can check it out on derustrong.com, uh, weight cut systematic strategies by Tony Ricci and myself and edited by yours truly, Jason Burgos. Yes, yes, yes. Very, very articulate guy right there. (laughs) Um, Love I mean, that, that is guy. my middle name, Articulate. It really is. Yeah, love that guy living in the boroughs <laughs> over there. The New York guy. You got to be articulate when you're living in the hood. You really have to be. That's, I'm telling you. you, you <laughs> there's only a few. You got you to gotta hold it down. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, And then in a couple weeks, man, like I said, I'll be going out. If you're in Burbank, California, I'm going out there. Meet PJ Nestler, Dan Gardner, engineering combat athletes. We got the seminar. Um, hope to see a lot of strength coaches out there, a lot of fighters in general, yeah. um, even a lot of skills coaches. I want a lot of those skills coaches to come out, you know, um, just to understand the processes of what we do, man. If we get guys and we get guys that, that coach the skills practice, what I mean by that is I mean like wrestling coaches, Brazilian jiu-jitsu coaches, boxing coaches, things like that, that can understand what we do from a physical preparation standpoint just makes – our lives a lot easier and it helps the fighter out tremendously so if they can understand why we're doing what we're doing and not just being you know a personal trainer or, or and i don't want to bash pts but you know i'm not out there counting reps and sets i'm actually fully coaching these guys mm-hmm. and and that's what we try to to uh, bring to the table when it comes down to physical preparation in combat sports so if they can understand that process then uh, i think it'll be a better well-rounded approach to the entire uh, to the entire system. So hopefully we can get some of those out there. Clinicians, you're always welcome. I love my physical therapist. I do a lot of my corrective exercises. Also, like I said, we're going to be having on a guy that I actually follow very, very closely. And I'm, and I'm certified in some of his systems, uh, functional range conditioning and functional range release and other forms of that. So, I mean, it's going to be good, man. I'm going to be giving you a lot of, uh, of good content. So will PJ and Dan. And then after that, um, we got King Mola Wall, man, fighting for Bellator. So I'm going to San Jose three – or I'm actually going to California mm-hmm. three weekends in a row. Nice. So I'll be going back and forth from Florida to California for three weeks straight, which is going to be uh, – I'm putting on my miles, man, putting up air <laughs> miles for sure. And then in June, I'm going to Poland. I'm mm-hmm. going to Poland finally. You know, I got the um, uh, Combat Sports Combat Sports Performance Summit. Or summit. <clears throat> I'll be out there doing my thing. And then uh, in July, I'm going back to Chechnya. It's going down, Russia. And then uh, October, we have Singapore. And then in between there, I'm probably going to go back to Vancouver. So anybody who's listening, just know those dates and understand that I am coming. I'm coming for it. <laughs> well, also, you forgot what, yeah, the one at your own facility in Florida. This is very true. This is very true, Jason. That's why I have you. I mean, you know, I have my You uses. see my calendar? You see my calendar? has got a lot of markups, man. <laughs> But, yeah, I do have one in my private facility in uh, 
little old Stewart, Florida. So if you want to come out to the to the sunny side of Florida and check me out, um, I'll be doing a, a private seminar. Just just doing you know just twenty and under. Not doing a whole lot of people. Okay. Um, just want to make it a little bit more private, more intimate. Um, get you know questions and answers going and. So it's like and, Phil Drew unplugged. Yeah, so, you know I'm you know me. <laughs> we, we have a guitar, have some, hopefully. We might have some beers. <laughs> be outstanding. I mean, that's about to be a part of your nutrition part of the the demonstration. You need the hops. Okay. You need the carbs post workout. There you go. Guarantee it's part of the vertical diet. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm definitely down for that. But in general, man, we're gonna be going over a lot of stuff, a lot of a lot of good content. Um, and also, I'll be going through a, a full. Uh, you know, everybody sees my my special exercises that I do with my fighters. So, I mean, I've been getting a lot of questions on that. And uh, even somebody even dubbed one of the one of the exercises that I do, the Daru press, which is fucking awesome. Somebody actually named the exercise after me. I'm on my way. I'm almost there, Jason. See that? We're almost at the top. I, somebody- just, I just like they use dub. You know, for the young buckaroos out there that don't know dub, back in the day when you had video <laughs> record, you had the tape, you heard some something on the radio. Like, oh, I don't got that. Let me boot. You put the tape in. And you record it, or your homeboy got the album on tape. He give it to you. You put the record in both double tape. And that's how you dub. But the yeah, young ones don't know man, about that. They don't know about that. Listen, I, uh, you, you try, it's trying to say I aged myself just now? Yes, and you're younger than me. <laughs> you're right. You're right. I got an old soul, man. My wife is eight years older than me, bro. Uh, she knows about dubbing. She knows about dubbing. She knows about she, the record button on the VCR. She, she might know about eight tracks, but I'm not going to say Oh listen. man, I'm in trouble. Oh, Fuck. Damn. She won't listen to this. No, I hope oh, not. She's whack. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but let's you know, you you mentioned it earlier. I mean, this week's edition of the show, we will be joined by Dr. Andreo Spina. Uh, Spina is the creator of the Functional Range Release Soft Tissue Management System, the Functional Range Conditioning Mobility Development System, and Kin Stretch. I mean, you know, it's a pretty groundbreaking stuff. If you, will, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to talk about some of the the organizations and professional sports that actually use these systems. But I mean, Phil, you, you know, you are, are a follower of here, a big time fan, a true believer, if you will. Like, mm-hmm. when is when, when did you first come into you know knowledge of Dr. Spina and his techniques and learn about him and then get involved with them yourself? Yeah, so I seen I seen a couple of uh, Instagram videos. Um, with a couple of fighters <clears throat> that I actually follow, um, that I was working with um, virtually over or online, and then I ended up going to a uh, a, a seminar over in Boston by uh, uh, it was Mike Boyle's seminar, and he has a he has a you know a gym out there, and then a couple of his guys that work with judo guys, and uh, and a trainer there <clears throat> that. Um, that's kind of like a uh, an intern, but also he's an MMA fighter. So he was telling me about it, and then he asked me, "Do I know who you know Dr. Andre Spino was?" And I I didn't know the name, but I knew what he did, and I knew kind of like it was a, it was based around movement systems, and I knew there was kind of like it was either like a, a, a mix between you know um, I want to say a mix between yoga and and just maybe a little bit actually a mix between yoga Pilates. And like, and like just formal movement patterns, mm. you know. So I was like, all right, let me let me check it out. And then it kind of reminded me a lot of what we have to do as far as like getting ready for jujitsu practice. Like as far as our warm ups go, a lot of the movement qualities, a lot of the the what they call um, animal exercises, basically, we're doing like bear crawls and crab walks and things like that, and just basically trying to move the body in multi multi directional, multifaceted movement patterns. Um, and, uh, I was liking it. I, I, I take, I took a liking to it and I finally was able to catch a seminar and a certification because it was close nearby and actually had a little bit of time on my hands and I caught one in Tampa and, um, Tampa, Florida, which is only like maybe two and a half hours from me. So I was like, perfect. Let me go out there and get it done. And then, um, you know, I started to, uh, work on that with my fighters and a lot of them that you see, you know, with the controlled articular rotations that we've done the end range holds end range end range release, things like that, pills and rails, all this stuff we're going to go over with Dre. But, um, you know, I, I've done this with, 
you know, all of my fighters, not just, you know, who you've seen on, on, on my Instagram feeds or whatever. Um, we've seen tremendous, tremendous increases in mobility and movement quality and overall performance and reduced injury risk. So, like, I was like, man, this is something that I need to have. And I'm also, like, looking to further my knowledge in it and get more certifications in it just because I believe in it. Um, and I feel like it's something that's missing in combat sports performance and it's something that I need to give to other coaches because like I said you know before in other podcasts man it's like these uh these fighters get fixed or they get set in these fixed positions due to skills practice and we got to get them moving like true humans so they can understand or at least know how to move their body in space when it's when in all facets of, of human movement not just skill specific and you're also making sure that you're you're conditioning the joints, you're conditioning the body and the tissues to withstand force and load under pressure and within real time. So I think that this is something that's going to be very beneficial for any combat sport athlete, any athlete in general. Mm-hmm. But just because, you know, this is my primary basis, who I work with. Um, and I also do it with my own, with my regular clients, you know, my, my general public who who sit at desks all day or, or you know, very stressed out from daily life, you know, and um, I work with a lot of like, I work with a lot of dentists, I work with a lot of nurses, a lot of doctors, and they can understand why we do it. And they're just so, and the same thing, man, they're just tight hips, you know, tight back, you know, things like that, because that's what they do on a daily basis. They're always, they're always on the go, or they're always sitting at a desk, or they're always sitting in their car. So I try to, I try to freely, um, move their body in, in ways that they can do it and do it on their own and not be passive and act and actually, you know, increase active range of motion through these movement patterns or systems. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, I also I would like to mention, you know, for you find all of our previous editions of the five train podcast, inc- podcast, including this breaking muscle exclusive episode with guests like Joe DeFranco, Dr. Andy Galpin, PJ Nestler and Zach Evanesh on iTunes, Spotify, Player FM, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, and on YouTube. I mean, please share, comment, leave us ratings, and all that stuff on those streaming services. Uh, before we get to D- Dr. Spina, uh, I wanted to ask a quick question. I first, you know, wanted to chat about the Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje fight from the <laughs> last weekend, which you had a major investment in. I mean, your your thoughts, we're now almost a week removed from that fight. What were your, your thoughts on the whole thing? Since you train and are very close friends with Mr. Poirier. Oh, man, I feel, I feel the gold is coming. I feel it. <laughs> I feel like we we are just at at like arm's reach of getting Khabib. Uh, Habib, my bad. Um, yeah, but I was really impressed. Um, I, I was I was more I wasn't really impressed because I know Dustin's abilities. You know, mm-hmm. um, I was happy with his performance, and and I was glad that people got to see a little bit more of what he does from a technical standpoint. And even though he did at times get in his brawling mindset, or or you know he he was throwing. A little bit wild at times and he didn't you know or quote unquote check the leg kicks and that's and that's an issue that you know people don't really understand um at the same time i think that he did great i think that he weathered the storm he showed that he was a true warrior like he is a true fighter but he also showed poise persistence you know perseverance and and um and he also you know like i said he, he he didn't go crazy when it was time to put him away, which was awesome. Like I seen him when he same thing what happened with Eddie when he hurt Eddie. Mm-hmm. Yep. He went crazy, you yeah. know, and, and it got him <laughs> caught. So like with this, you know, we can you can tell that he learns from his quote unquote mistakes, yeah. I guess. And uh and Gagey didn't do so. I mean, you thought maybe I mean Gagey all he had to really do a lot of the times, man, shoot for a fucking takedown, man. Like do something other than try to brawl. And, and, you know, go punch for punch. You know, at the end of the day, man, CTE is real. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, but <laughs> I think that he uh, he showed that he was a true fighter. It opened a lot of people's eyes, I hope. You know, and then in, in, in all generalness, I just seen it on Twitter. Um, you know, Ali, his, his uh, Habib's manager, was basically saying it's like it's like it's either GSP, Connor or Dustin. Everybody else can shut up. So I was like, all right, cool. You know, Dustin retweeted it. He said, let me get that. And uh, 
So, I mean, it, it, hopefully we'll see what happens, man, you know. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, I was real pleased. And, um, yeah, obviously we have always something to work on. There's always something to work on. Yeah. I'm, I was I was pleased with his uh, with his conditioning, obviously. He always has top-notch conditioning. We're not worried about that. I was also pleased with his, his, his muscular and strength endurance where a lot of times that was our main issue a lot of the times because he's so – slow twitch dominant he has a high vo2 max where he he has he, he has the ability to consume oxygen very efficiently um but um as far as strength endurance it's hard for him to carry through throughout you know long duration we finally fixed that problem um due to you know proper preparation due to you know starting from 16 weeks out we we literally were doing you know, out of camp programming, 16 weeks out from in, in before we even knew we had Gage, he was he was training, he was doing his physical preparation, getting his body ready for the demands ahead. And this way, when he came into camp, when he start, when he when he moved, well, when he when he you know came to ATT, you know, he's, he usually lives in Louisiana now, mm-hmm. but when he came to ATT, he was already in shape. He was probably like three weeks. Like from eight weeks out, he was three weeks out from peaking. So I had to kind of, I had to kind of um, coast him throughout the uh, the entire, you know, eight to six weeks. And then we gave him a deload. We deload him on the fifth or I'm sorry, four weeks out. And then uh, he had a super compensation at three weeks out because he was already rested. So he had a stimulus recoverable, ad- recoverable adaptation. And uh, and from there, man, we just kind of just coasted him in. You could kind of see it in um in my later videos because it's all documented you know if you look at my instagram you look at my youtube you know we we went from eight weeks out all the way to about two weeks out <clears throat> and um within two weeks out man he was moving fast speed was on point his his movement patterns were definitely way better um his power was still there and his strength still was there too so i mean and also you know integrating nick and and mind buddy one and doing the cognitive conditioning mm-hmm. I was keeping his mind sharp and was also let, giving us uh, the ability to train even when he was physically exhausted, but not mentally exhausted. So that was also a good, uh, a good um, add on to uh, the camp. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a. Uh very impressive watching his maturity level change in the last you know few years i think he's now eight and one or seven and one since he moved to to 155 which is extremely impressive i mean just his growth as how he fights from a more exciting brawler kind of type to now he's much more well-rounded like you said he he didn't go wild when he hurt gaethje and it just it's great to see the maturity as a man as a fighter just great um it's 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 crazy how the ufc put themselves in such a weird position with bad luck and conor mcgregor but it's he without a doubt doesn't completely deserves a towel shot but i do i would be wrong if i didn't say i felt bad for tony ferguson because the guy tripped from an accident during an interview uh, scheduled by the ufc and you know tears his ligament and now he was the champion doesn't even get a towel shot so it's a tough spot i feel bad for anybody who doesn't get the shot hopefully it is for dustin because that would be cool would be different and new and refreshing and i just think yeah. habib habib and ferguson's just cursed but uh but then who knows conor mcgregor may show up and then that changes everything and then dustin and ferguson have to wait which is real bullshit but, yeah, well that's what's gonna happen there is they'll probably give us ferguson <laughs> you know that would be crazy and and, and as a fan I would love it. I'd be great, very grateful, but I would still feel bad because that means the loser who really should be, it should have been Ferguson fighting Habib, and then that guy should have been fighting Dustin Poirier in a few months. Now, one of them is going to lose out after a lot of work, but that is the way it goes, and that is MMA and sports in a nutshell. Yeah, for sure, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think that, uh, I mean, I think that any fight is a good fight for us, but, you know, it, it's easier to get out of bed and really train. I mean, for him, he does it anyways, mm-hmm. but... I'm going to be like, all right, we got Habib, let's ride. But even if we get Ferguson or or, or Kevin Lee or even Barbosa, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I mean, those are all those are all names that could be drawn out the hat to go fight. I mean, but Dana did say we are in the running. Yeah, yeah. And I knew it. And I said, I said, well, listen, man, I was like, it's funny because I think you had posted something on it and I wanted to smack you a little bit. What? But I can't say because I because no, nah, I, 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 I like you a lot, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Well, you can't. You in Florida, so you can't do nothing. I will. I will go through this fucking microphone <laughs> and grab you. Anyways, please tell me about this smackable. What? What happened? No, man, because I was literally ready to 
get the call to hear that Dustin was going to to Brooklyn mm-hmm. to get a fight. Mm-hmm. And uh, you were like, "Well, that's not fair." And you said that it would it would it would it would mess up the card. For was the that wrong game. though? No, no, you was not wrong. But don't say that, man. Why? Why? It's not he up. reading it or they, you, you DW. Want, you DW's want, your boy. He's not my boy. He's not reading it. Yeah, he might. He might. We're getting up there. No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but like, I, and I knew that was gonna happen because it would it would have messed up the card. And yeah, if he I, was coming event, he totally, I think they would have got a call. But you can't just ruin a whole uh, other show, you know. And look, we, look, we would have lost out on such a great fight. And I think that fight with Gaethje even blew up his 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 name even more. So and I, I, you know what, I I like Dusty. He's been on the show before. Good guy, earned a shot. I don't want to see him get a shot on like seven days' notice. It's not fair to him. He should deserve no. an entire camp to really take this opportunity. This is his first title shot. I, I'm glad that it, I'd rather see him get the, the time to do it. No, you're right, and and that's and that was uh, and I and I could totally understand, and 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 I like I do like that. You know what I mean? And and we were getting ready for Gage. It's totally different. Um, yeah, big time. Totally different team. You know, totally different camp. Totally different approach. Yeah. So yeah, I get you. It is now time for our guest. He's the creator of the Functional Range Release System, the Functional Range Conditioning Mobility Development System, and the Kin Stretch Method of Movement. These groundbreaking techniques and certifications are used by notable professional sports organizations like the New York Rangers, Houston Astros, Portland Trailblazers, Los Angeles Lakers, Nike, and even the Onnit Academy. Not only is he mastered in these techniques, he's even a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Jitsu. To learn more about these systems, you can watch a plethora of his videos on it on his YouTube page or learn more at functionalanatomyseminars.com. But we are very lucky to have him on the show this week. He is Dr. Andreo, Andreo Spina. Thank you for being a guest this week, Dr. Spina. Oh, excuse me, Dre. Yeah, you know what? I have to I have to stop you right away. I am not a black belt in Brazilian what? Jiu-Jitsu. Phil told no. me you were. Oh man, he's a black belt in my mind, man. <laughs> I'm a black belt in, in Kempo Karate, and I've been studying uh, Taekwondo and striking arts since I was about five years old. Oh, that's um, but uh, I am actually a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Nice, nice. Yeah. Well, that, there we go right there. You know what's even funnier is that I actually started in Kempo Karate, so that makes a lot of sense. So oh, see, I, I already could tell we connected in that way automatically. I, 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 knew, I knew there was something. <laughs> exactly, man. Yeah. So, so Dre, um, for the people that may not know, I mean, you know, Jason kind of hit on it a little bit, but you know, uh, let let the listeners know exactly, you know, what's your background of yourself and and how you began to develop functional range systems that I use, you know, consistently throughout all my all my training sessions and for my fighters. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, going back to uh, what we were just talking about earlier, so I've been. Uh, studied the martial arts since uh, since the time I can remember remembering things, um, and uh, you know past that I, I think I, I started studying the human body for that purpose of, of trying to improve uh, my performance, which quickly um, you know as you get older has to turn into some kind of job, or in my mind it did. Um, so I went into uh, into chiropractic. So I, I did a background uh, degree in kinesiology. And then I, uh, I went and, uh, and studied chiropractic and became a chiropractor um, as well as an acupuncturist. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a long story that kind of boils down to I was obsessed with, with actually fully understanding what it is that, that I was trying to do as both a chiropractor and a trainer from a scientific uh, perspective and being genuinely – unhappy with the answers that I was receiving. Uh, so that started me on a, a very long path of, of trying to answer, uh, well, set out clear logical questions and, and try to answer those questions using scientific literature. Uh, and I, I always tell people I never wanted to you know, start systems and, and I never intended on, on traveling and teaching systems. I really just was selfish in, in regards to that in wanting to know what I was doing and not being happy with with what I was hearing. So I, I really took a, a bird's eye view of the scientific literature with regards to how to uh, heal the human body, but but that actually became how to control the human body in order to improve performance. And uh, what I, I teach and what I always tell people I teach is my interpretation of what I think the science is telling us to do with regards to how to make people uh, – 
control themselves much more effectively and, and safely. Nice. So, I mean, that, that like, like you said, that spiraled into um, developing a system of assessing and treating um, mm -hmm. for injuries. Uh, and then that became functional range conditioning, which is the, the you know, teaching people how to, how to assess the body in terms of how to make people control themselves better. And then kin stretch kind of spiraled off of that. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's actually something that I'm going to go get certified in in a couple of weeks down in Costa Mesa. So I'll be out there getting a kin stretch certification. So hopefully I, I may see you. If I don't, it's all good. I understand you're busy, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know where you know nowadays they they they, they give me plane tickets and uh, you know the week before <laughs> they me to show up. So I hear you. I think um I think Hunter. And Dewey are going to be out there for that I one. I believe. I believe. Yeah, Dewey. Uh, Dewey leads the uh, the uh, the kin stretch, who is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, yes, and yes, actually yes, created yes. me uh, for my blue belt. So there's a little bit of information for you. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to go roll with him after when I get out there, and we'll see. You pitch well, rolling with an amazing black belt who's ridiculously mobile. And, uh, I know, man. That's exactly. that's like a, almost an anomaly. You can't really get that a lot of times. He said something funny the other day. He said, uh, you know, mobility is like having the cheat codes in Contra, if you remember that, that video. <laughs> yes. And, and, and when, when you roll him, it's just like, it's like how, did the, how did your foot end up across my head? Like, how is that possible? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, Drake, can you give the, give the listeners a true definition of what the difference is between flexibility and true mobility and why it's important for athletes to attain these functions? Yeah, so... If you actually go back to the root word of mobility, it actually comes from the Latin word movera, which means to move. Uh, and because of that, there's an active component to what you're saying. When you're saying I'm mobile, you're saying I'm able to access and utilize my flexibility via the guidance of your own nervous system. So it's an active component to your, your capacity to create movement. When you're talking about flexibility, you're really talking about the passive ability to achieve a range of motion when you're under the influence of an external force. So when you're doing the splits, for example, you're, the external force is gravity, which is putting you into that position. Now, bringing this back to fighters, because I, I tend to always do that, if I'm teaching <clears throat> one of my students you know, how to kick, uh, a lot of students will, will want to throw those head kicks and they'll sit there you know, hours and hours trying to achieve the flexibility that they think would be required to throw a kick. And then you go to try to throw that kick in, in live combat and you end up falling on your ass. And, and I always say that as you're falling, that's when you start to realize the difference between mobility and flexibility. Flexibility is what your body can do passively. Mobility is how much access your nervous system has to your flexibility. Now, why that's important, it, it's, it's really everything. I mean, there's, there's not a sport that I know of that, that occurs passively. There, there's there's not a you know a worthwhile human activity that I know of that really uh, you know is done passively other than taking Instagram photos, but for the <laughs> most part you're, you're asking yourself to either control your own weight or to try to control the weight of another person, um, which is an active uh, which always has an active component. So just because you're flexible, it doesn't mean you have the strength in those flexible ranges of motion to be able to utilize the flexibility. And probably more importantly, if you ever have to defend that flexibility, i.e., if you have to absorb load as you're displaying this flexibility, if all you've done is, is taught your body to get there passively, you're not increasing your ability to absorb or, or absorb or create load. So that means, number one, if you can't absorb load, you're going to injure the tissue because that's what tissue injury is. It's when the mm -hmm. load going into a tissue exceeds the ability to absorb. Mm -hmm. And number two, if you can't create load or power or strength in the flexible range, then you'll never be able to access the flexibility in, in any live movement. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, to have your systems be used by major sports organizations legitimizes it, you know, on a level that just massive. Um, how did all of that come about that these organizations started using FR and FRC? I mean, who, who was the first team to use it? How much work did you have to do to make them believers in these systems and they were the seriously stuff they had to take on? Um, you know what? I did exactly no work. <laughs> in terms of no, in terms of uh, of trying to advertise. Once again, I, I was not ever in the in the mindset that I want to teach this to pros. Like in my brain, every human is is a, is a professional athlete, whether they know it or not. 
or whether they want to to act that way or not. I mean, see, I told you, Phil, I'm an athlete too. You didn't believe oh, me. Oh God! I mean, go. from, from an evolutionary pr- uh, perspective, if you weren't, then natural selection would have rubbed you out a long time ago. So, <laughs> uh, in my mind, it's just make the bo- make bodies un- like make people control themselves better. Now, I, I taught it that way. And I, I guess I can bring it back. There's uh, one gentleman uh, named Neil Rampy, or Neil Ramp, actually. And he now is with the L.A. Dodgers, but uh, he was with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, and that was the f- – he was the f- – I, I don't know how that happened, but he must have come to a course. Maybe he heard of the course through someone else. And this to the Diamondbacks and – uh, you know, of course, I was like, I'm, I'm not a baseball guy in the least. But I think that's how I started the seminar. I went there and I was like, as much as I love teaching this, I can't. I don't even like watching baseball. <laughs> but <laughs> that's how it's. But I mean, of course, I appreciate the sport and all. And it's kind of joking, but you know, in my system, it doesn't matter what you're trying to do with yourself. That's probably a bad sentence too. It doesn't matter what sport you're trying to achieve or what. It, it, it works for everyone because it's all about controlling yourself. So awesome. I started with him, and from there. I just had another team contact, another team, and then a different sport came. Uh, you know, it, people in 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 pro leagues, they they kind of you know, hockey mingles with baseball, mingles with football, mingles with soccer, kind of thing. And it was it was honestly a it was just a word of mouth um, type scenario. And yeah, it was of no uh, it was of no effort on my own. I, I'm, I'm happy to say, or I'm, I'm lazy and sane. Perfect. See a message to the kids out there: You can have success without doing anything. Isn't that? Just, <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, honestly, to to that's uh, I don't know if that's the message, but in my, <laughs> I, uh, I, I I just like I just like the topic, and I like to talk about it. Yeah. And I think when I teach it, uh, that's that's what what occurs. Like as soon as I teach a course, I, the first thing I always tell people is, look, uh, let's just pretend we're all friends here. Like I'm not going to go up there and pretend I'm above anyone and put on a suit and tie. I, I'm not that guy. I, I just like, I, I know stuff because I worked my ass off to, to know it and, and people are, are interested and I'm humbled every time I have a room full of people who are interested in my perspective. So I give it and it, it just so happens that my perspective seems to to apply to whatever athletic population you, 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 you're part of or not part of. Yeah. Now, I mean, as you know, you know the, your systems and your techniques broaden and they continue to get out there. And is there, you know, for maybe listeners that are athletes out there, are there any particular sports who has, has you know, the athletes who started to use it have seen like market improvements in their abilities from getting into FR, FRC, and Kinza Stretch? You know, are there are there maybe any examples of somebody like, oh, he, he's in this sport and he started using it. And man, it made such a huge difference just as, as an example. Uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, I don't know that I want to say people uh, name people specifically. Um, it's it's. I'm, I'm sure people can look up the the athletes that I, I currently work with, with and have worked with. Um, but it, like I said, it's you give me a baseball player. It's it, let's put it this way: you, you you take any athlete and you take a hockey player. A hockey player can spend too much time on flexibility. Right. Mm -hmm. So they in other words, they can spend a lot of time trying to do the splits, which is really not even going to benefit them past a certain point. You can take a basketball player and you can spend too much time making them strong or you can take a tennis player and spend too much time working on power, which could otherwise be used to improve tennis skill. But the one thing that you can't get too much of is control of yourself. Mm -hmm. And. That's that's why if you give if you give me a fighter, if I break down the fighter and I and I'm able to tell you, you know, these are the joints that are not working like they should. And when individual joints don't work like they should, then when you ask those joints to play nicely with other joints, Mm -hmm. that's not going to work well either. Mm -hmm. That's that's like a a fundamental rule of human movement. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if 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 I if I work with the, the, the Mariners, I mean, what they're trying to do is they're trying to take their joints and and make them function properly. And then once they function properly, you can very easily enhance performance in any way you want. Um, So when I work with an athlete, it's not a matter of of will that, you know, will my system make them better? I don't know any other way to do it because my system just follows 
what I believe the scientific literature is is telling us with regards to how to achieve those goals. So you can give me a freaking curler or you can give me a, you know, an amateur crossfitter who does it on the weekends. And really, the only difference is going to be, you know, how you program that person, the intensity of the program, the frequency of the training. But really, we're all doing the same things. If your shit doesn't work, then your shit doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's very true, man. And and people have seen me go through the FRC with with some of my fighters, and I can I can honestly say that it made it made a huge difference in their overall biomechanics, neurological control, along with decreased tissue damage. But but Dre, can you explain a bit more on you know for the listeners in general, but um, a bit more about functional range conditioning and what exactly is it and how and or where the prerequisites are for these principles. Okay, so really, what, if you take the functional range systems, which is the, 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 the name that I give to kind of the way that I approach any human being that's put in front of me, what it is is a thought process. And the thought process is, is predicated on, the, on the, the, the concept that, number one, we have to, there's certain things that each joint is supposed to be able to do in order to define it as a, as a, as a well-functioning joint. Now, <clears throat> in a functional range assessment, which is another one of the systems that I teach, we go over the multiple ways that we can define what a shoulder is supposed to be capable of and what it's actually doing. So we start out in the functional range system uh, with assessing people's articulations individually. Now, why individually? That's a really important question because if you look at most training systems nowadays, it's it's very sexy to say, I'm only going to work on functional exercises. People will always talk about, you know, I only squat or I only do deadlifts, and they'll they'll walk around someone in a gym who's doing bicep curls, and they'll they'll almost laugh and they'll say, well, they're not being functional because you know your shoulder has to work with your hip, has to work with your knee, has to work with your ankle, mm -hmm. and I 100% don't disagree. But what I always tell people is that. Articular independence is, is necessity in order to have articular interdependence. In other words, if you want your joints to play nice with each other, they have to do their own jobs. So the first thing that we do is assess all of the joints of anyone's body, and we have a way of determining whether or not they're capable of functioning at a basic human level. If not, that's the first entry point with functional range conditioning, we start to assign exercises that will specifically alter human tissue and in so doing eventually will alter neurological functioning in order to make that, that shoulder a human shoulder. Now once you take a shoulder that's working properly under, under the, the, the definition that we provide, well then you say, okay, so in order to be an athlete, we actually have to make that shoulder function in almost a superhuman level in, in order to achieve certain sports. So take a baseball pitcher, for example. Uh, you know, you look at what a baseball pitcher's shoulder is doing, and that's, that's not a normal evolutionary function of the human shoulder. Like back yeah. in the days of hunter-gatherers, like when you pick up a rock, you chuck it at an animal, the animal's dead. Nobody ever picked up the rock and repeatedly chucked it at the dead animal putting different <laughs> spins and curves on the thing. That's not, a, that's not a normal thing to ask of a shoulder. So if you want a shoulder to be able to withstand the hell that is repeatedly pitching a baseball, now you have to look at what is the capacity that's necessary in that shoulder for it to, to be able to function long term. Mm -hmm. So we start, let's say at the shoulder, depending on what the assessment tells us, we start to humanize that joint and then we start to progressively work to increase its capacity. Now, how do we do that? We, there's, I mean, I don't know how, how many hours we have to speak here, but it's, it's really utilizing fundamental scientific principles that are applied in a logical, systematic way. And that brings me to a point which I don't know if I ever got off in a podcast, but so I'd like to do it here. Let's do it. People Let's do it. Yes. often say, you know, Oh, I saw what he does on Instagram. You know, that looks like this or, yeah, he's not doing anything new or he's not reinventing the wheel. And I'm like, yeah, fucker, I don't, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Like, if, yeah, I always tell people, if you come to my seminar, 
and you go, man, that guy was speaking a different language. I have never heard of those concepts before in my life. Mm. Then I just made up a whole bunch of crap. So what I want people to do is come to the seminar, and this is what happens every time, and they go, you know what? That is a logical step-by-step method of applying stuff that we know in the scientific literature in order to achieve very specific goals that are clearly what is necessary to bring that athlete to the next level. Like mm. people, they, they want they want magic. They want me to tell them that you're going to come here and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to fix your foot in in two visits and blah blah blah. <laughs> it's, it's like we all work within the realm of of physics, right? Like mm. you can't you can't go out of the universal laws and and speed things up. So it, it, we all function under the same rule. So what we're doing is we're we're organizing our approach and we're we're specifically trying to achieve goals and when those goals are specifically achieved it it makes the body do better and when the body does better whatever you use that body for it's going to get better because you learn by the way your body functions like mm-hmm. you you know people talk about the brain and the nervous system and I want the nervous system to move this way and I want to change the patterns and put in blah, blah, blah. I mean, your brain is encapsulated in a skull. It's almost, it's blocked out of the outside world and it's mm-hmm. receiving inputs from receptors in your tissues. That's how it learns. Now, mm-hmm. if those receptors and those tissues are of poor quality, then your brain learns poor things and it's going to output poor human movement. If you can improve the incoming signal, what we call the afferent signal, then you will immediately improve the speed of learning. You'll immediately prove the, the body's ability to deal with variables. So I don't know if that was a, a, a more generic answer, but FRC mm. is the component of that where we start to say, your shoulder doesn't do this. Now we're going to apply these principles, whether it be cars or pails and rails or passive range holds, passive range liftoffs. That brings me to another thing that people are like, what are all these acronyms and Mm-hmm. Why are you making all this stuff up? I'm not making anything up. <laughs> I'm just giving names so that it's organized in our brain so that when someone has someone in front of them, they can they can they can program for them. Mm-hmm. And if there's one thing that you get from when I lecture, it's I, I hate random nonsense workouts where people just, you know, you know, I lift things up and put things down and it doesn't <laughs> yeah. work like mm-hmm. like there there's there's rep counters and there's trainers. And, yeah. and I, I in, in FRC, I want I work with trainers, people who are trying to alter human capacity using progressive adaptations and, you know, working under the laws of the specificity principle and, 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 and other principles, which are very well settled in the scientific world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, yeah, th- th- there's no magic um, to what I'm doing. It's just that when you're organized, things happen faster because that's just what the the literature tells us to do that that was probably i don't even know if i, I don't even remember the question to be honest no, with you. it's that's that's fine i was just sitting there taking notes i'm probably gonna have to go <laughs> back and listen to this podcast again um but yeah thank you dre i appreciate that yeah man i can uh, go deep. Just, just I, me... I hear you man that's why we got you on the show bro um but you know that that makes sense because in this sport and in, in mixed martial arts in general there's a lot of like just you know, throw shit at the wall, trying to make it stick type movements and type exercises and things like that, where people like myself and others like I work with are are trying to negate that factor and try to actually work on program design and periodization and and scheduling and understanding, you know, you know, specificity and, and, and auto regulation techniques and things like that. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You have to have a structured plan in order to do anything otherwise you know you're just basically throwing your head against the wall trying to trying to make sure that you don't get knocked fuck out but <laughs> same That's time. right and, and you know what people might like hear that and they might confuse it in saying well you know no you have to work on movement variability and you have to work on all that. Sure. And, and I and you are not saying that you don't mm-hmm. it's not that you're not but but when you're trying to take an athlete from point A to point B you know, randomly learning how to do, I, I don't know, just, you know, hand balancing because it's cool or, mm. or uh, you know, random movements because they look very pretty. I mean, that that's great. But like you said, we need the person to be able to internally rotate that hip so when they throw their swing, they mm. can put more damage into that meat. And if yeah. you want that hip to internally rotate, 
how are you going to do it, right? Yeah, And definitely. a lot of people, the way that, I mean, I always say that a lot of people nowadays, they, the, the way that they structure their training is they go on Instagram and they're like, well, let's look at some cool shit to do. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> look at that's it ex, right there. <laughs> like, they'll look at like X dancer and they'll go, oh, well, look at how much control they have. I'm like, yeah, dude, that guy's been dancing for fucking his whole life. Of course he can do that. But when, when you take someone who has, you know, they have a labral tear or they, they have scar tissue accumulation, then what that requires is science. Yeah. Because you, you like you can't take someone who's functioning perfectly and, and say, well, what does he do? It doesn't matter what he does. If you're functioning like hell, you can't go and mimic people who are functioning perfectly. So people grab exercises like a, uh, I don't know, uh, they, they'll grab like a Turkish get up. They go, oh my God, this is the most functional exercise in the world. <laughs> functional for what? Like who gets out of bed like a Turkish person? Like, yeah. <laughs> what does that mean that it's functional? That's another thing that I'm confused about. Like that exercise functional and that exercise is not. Well, yeah. it, it really it's the person who has the functional capacity to do the exercise that we should be worried about not naming whether or not an exercise is functional. The same exercise, you give me two different people, it's a great exercise for one, it's the dumbest exercise for the other. Mm -hmm. And if you can't tell the difference, then you're just randomly assigning, you're just throwing shit at the wall and hoping it sticks. Yeah, yeah. So the moral, the moral. And I mean, like you said, you can you can lose in basketball and it sucks. You yeah. lose an MMA and, and, and someone's life is changing, you know what I mean? They're getting hurt, so I mean, you so, can't you can't be random. I mean, I guess to sum up what what Dre just said, you know, folks, there's levels to this shit, and uh, you gotta you gotta know your role and uh, work on your way up. You know what I'm saying? So, but it it makes a lot of sense, and and even going to the certifications, like, and you've said it before, it's not just exercises. We're not trying to you know develop or you know put out or give out exercises you know, for the masses, it's more about principles and taking those principles and actually training and doing it the right way. So I do appreciate the way you, you go about running it and, uh, and introducing these principles for these systems that we use now. And what I've been using for, I don't know, the past couple months and it's been really working. So, I mean, I've been working with fighters for over a decade now. And as a former fighter myself, I know how important it is to understand connective tissue and its role in fight specific performance. Now, Dre, can you give us a quick overview on the concepts of bioflow and the components of the extracellular matrix? Sure. So the bioflow uh, concept was really, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a lecture on anatomy, but I, I always say that it, in, my le in my seminars, you'll have, you'll have, you know, uh, sport medical doctors, you'll have chiropractors, you'll have physiotherapists, you'll have strength and conditioning specialists, you'll have, you know, a whole bunch of different people, and and what 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 is common to all of us that have studied the human body is that we're really really good at dead person anatomy. Like if if our clients and patients were cadavers, we would nail that shit. Because w what do you learn? You learn that this is the bicep and this is where it is on a beautiful colored picture. Or if you have you know if you were in Cairo school when I was going, you, you would do cadaver dissection. And you would put a pin in something and say, what is that? And you'd be like, oh, that's the ulnar nerve. Oh, okay, you know your anatomy. Well, mm -hmm. no, you don't. You know the anatomy of a, of a, of a, of a cadaver that has mm -hmm. been dissected. But what bioflow is, is a way of trying to lecture and explain to people how human tissue exists in the living person and how that human tissue creates human movement. And, and one thing that we realize is that the majority of stuff in your body is, is under the broad category of connective tissue. I mean, this includes your all the casings of your muscles, it includes your bones, it includes your your uh, the fascia, the tendons, the ligaments, the, the the cartilage. I mean, all of the stuff that makes fill fill, the majority of it is connective tissue. And if you study connective tissue, what you realize is it's it's, it's really all the same stuff. It's just different permeations of that stuff. You can break down connective tissue into what we call like cells, and then the cells produce fibers and the, and ground substance, which is kind of the fluid component of your tissues. Now, the difference between a bone and the tendon that inserts into that bone is just a compositional change of what, uh, what types of fibers, the percentages of fibers, and what types of ground substance. 
So when people go, you know, where does this muscle come from and go to? It, it's a weird question. Like I always say the bicep starts somewhere in the body and inserts into the rest of it. Because really, the bone grows the bicep. The bicep becomes the tendon, which becomes the capsule, which becomes. So what I'm explaining with bioflow is that tissue is just the exact same tissue that is in slight deviations or different compositions becomes other tissues. Now, how does the tissue become that tissue? It, 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 it only becomes one tissue versus another tissue based on the way it's used. Mm -hmm. the, the forces that go into a tissue will it determine what parts of the genome, what parts of the cellular um, uh, coding you know, gets translated into protein. So if you load a tissue, any tissue, if you start loading it like bone, it's going to become bone. If you start loading it like uh, tendon, it becomes tendon. And we have a, various examples. Like uh, if you take someone who had an ACL reconstruction, so the anterior cruciate ligament is torn. So we'll take a patellar tendon and we'll replace the ligament with a tendon. Now, if you were to go in and, and biopsy that graft, you know, 10 years after the graft occurs and you put it under a microscope, what do you see? You no longer see cells and fibers and ground substance that resembles a ligament. It now is, or sorry, a tendon. It's now ligament. It becomes ligament. Why? Because the forces going into it tell the cells, this is what I need you to be able to withstand. Mm -hmm. So how does that become important? It becomes important because it, when you realize that the stuff you're working with is just stuff and the language that the stuff speaks is force, then if you can master the forces that go into the tissue, you can make real alterations in human tissues. And guess what? It doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't happen by getting your back rubbed for a half an hour and people talking weird things like I'm breaking up your scar tissue and I'm <laughs> if you want tissue to change it it, it it takes force over time and and none of that happens quickly and if you want it to happen you have to know how to apply that force and you have to know when not to apply that force and like you said there's levels to this and and you, you spoke about the cellular matrix so if you take any tissue Every tissue is really just a continuation of another tissue. And if you go down to the cellular level, the cells of a tendon, you know, they're connected to all of the other cells in the immediate area as well mm -hmm. through what's called the extracellular matrix. And mm -hmm. through the extracellular matrix, that's connected through the cell into the cell, which is the intercellular matrix. And then from the intercellular matrix, it's physically connected into the nucleus of the cell, the internuclear matrix which is really connected right to the DNA. So when you're assigning an exercise, people are like, oh, I just lift shit up and put it down. No, you're actually dictating what part of the genetic code is gonna get translated into protein. Like trainers' jobs are far more important than they give themselves credit for. Again, that's a crazy answer, but going back, bio, <laughs> it's, it's the idea that your tissue is listening, it, it, it doesn't speak English, it doesn't speak Italian, it, it speaks force. The cells don't have brains, right? So they don't really know, quote unquote, what they're doing. They're just feeling things. And, and what they feel is force. That's why I always say force is the language of cells and movement is what you say. And you have to speak clearly if you want stuff to happen. If you have a tendinopathy, if you, one of your fighters has a tendinopathy and you think that rubbing it or you know, putting magic potions or, or sprinkling, you know, healing crystals. I don't know what, what people do. <laughs> That's not going to change the, the cellular composition of that tissue. In order to do that, you have to speak the language it speaks. You have to speak force. And there's a difference between, let's talk about soft tissue work. There's a difference between randomly rubbing tissue and hoping for the best versus applying force with, with the intent of creating a directional message which will then in sequence start the process of remolding which needs to be backed up with proper training inputs along the same lines of force in order to reinforce the message that your soft tissue did mm -hmm. so i mean we can go into that too but my soft tissue system is a lot of the same principles as the training system it's just force application man. it's just you know, it, it, when I'm applying force to a client, it's it's soft tissue therapeutic forces in order to change tissue. 
When you're doing FRC, it's internal force application, telling them to lift this or do this in a particular way. Again, you, it's force, it's just force control. You take mm -hmm. it to fighting in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, that's just a different amount of force control. <laughs> when you're trying mm -hmm. to, now you're just trying to put force to, to, to do the opposite and damage the tissue. But yes. all of this lies on a continuum, which is, it's completely understandable under the premise of the bioflow concept. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's an, it's particularly important for jiu-jitsu guys and even just in general with MMA, um, learning the body and, and proprioception, joint centration, things like that. But also learning how to move your, your body freely through space is, is something that a lot of the fighters lack, you know, because they've been stuck in a sport specific, uh, you know, technical stance all their life and they develop these compensation patterns they develop imbalances and things like that where their joints just get stiff and uh get stiffened in in, in sometimes in the right ways because they need that that certain you know that certain i guess biomechanical feedback because if they don't do what they need to do in the in the cage they're going to get hurt but they also need to learn how to move like a human and um and that's what I try to incorporate in, into all of my training sessions now, just because I just see so much discrepancies, dis dysfunction due to sport specific demands and their skills practice and what happened to them due to that. I mean, there's a lot of kyphotic postures, things like that. I see shoulder problems, hip problems. I mean, we've done videos with uh, King Mo the Wall, who's who's been in this game forever, you know, and I've and I've been training Legend. him. Legend. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I mean, he's got a fight coming up, and and people really don't understand how how messed up his body is, and how how still he's able to you know perform at the highest level. And we've been doing these, uh, we've been doing controlled articular rotations. I've been doing some end range holds, some end range hovers, pails and rails, things like that that we learn in FRC. And and you can definitely see a difference. He feels a difference in his uh, in his training. Same thing with Dustin Poirier and Joanna Janjacek. They all feel a difference. They feel more stable. Um, they feel more capable of moving in multi-directional patterns. Uh, it's just a better overall outcome. And and on top of that, we're we're at least reducing the risk of injury and non-contact injury, which is it shouldn't be at all a case if you're if you're an optimal strength and conditioning coach by any means if you're a coach and you got guys injured um with non-contact injuries you know then then you're not really doing your job well so that's why i decided to um to go and and do frc and and actually going and getting kin stretch and do fra also just so i can broaden my 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 base of knowledge with this because i know it's going to be beneficial for all my athletes and for myself in general and, and you bring, I think you bring, you're, you're alluding to a really important point. And by the way, that Poirier fight was crazy, man. <laughs> yeah. Like if anybody, did, like, like, you know, that guy's obviously a, a champ, but yeah. I mean, his conditioning was, it was top notch. You can yeah, see it. So, I mean, that, that, that was a great job. But Thanks. I was going to bring up, uh, I, I think uh, one thing where people get confused out uh, is the idea that we're, we're training someone's movement. Like mm. people, they're, they're so focused on, you know, you know, if you're if you, again, you're trying to throw a leg kick. You're, I'm trying to teach one of my my students how to how to throw a hook kick, and you're like, well, these are the movements you have to do. Well, if you if I give you two athletes, right, and I give you one athlete whose hip has, you know, is riddled with connective tissue scarring, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, possibly has some tearing, labral tearing, maybe an osteophyte developed, uh, you know, connective tissue that's scarred is is pretty much dead. So the mechanoreceptors are are no longer present. And then I give you another athlete whose hip has, you know, various degrees of freedom with which to deal with variability. It has healthy tissues with, with healthy mechanical receptors. Who is easier to teach that hook kick to? Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about how p motor learning, the way that your, your brain learns is by receiving information from the, bod but from the body. So you go try this movement. And your brain actually receives the afferent or the incoming message from the, the receptors in the tissue. Mm -hmm. If you have great quality receptors, then your brain is getting good up-to-date information and it's going to learn so much faster. So I think one of the major problems is that people are so focused on, I, I want you to be a better mover. I'm going to make you move better. Mm -hmm. But really, you're not really working on the movement. You're, you're reverse engineering the movement. You're... You, you need to make sure that the brain has information, which means that 
you have to make sure the tissue and the, the, the joints are doing their job. And, and then you're gonna you're gonna learn that skill way way faster, and I think that's a, that's something that I think people need to focus more on is not what you're telling the the athlete's brain to try to accomplish, but what the athlete's body is telling it, his his or her own brain. Mm-hmm. And that's that's yeah. a huge component of the FRC system. Yeah, for sure. It, it, I get it. I understand it, and it's and it's. You know, telling these these fighters, these athletes, you know what we're doing, they bought into the system because they see a difference. So it's not a big deal for me. Like in in the beginning, I was kind of just like they're like, "What the hell am I doing?" You know, um, because they just want to train. They want to train hard. They want to beat themselves into the ground. You know, um, and and you know, Dustin and and um, and guys that are like at the higher levels and that been in the sport for a while, they try to reach for new ways of, of getting better. And if we can get them better from a performance aspect, doing new things and new innovative things, they, they definitely enjoy and they understand the process that goes behind it. But um, but yeah, I see it, like I said, I see a big difference. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, when, when you start to, you take a pro athlete and you, and, you, and, you, and you show them, okay, so this is what your hip should be doing. And, and now, you know, do a cars. Let me see what your hip does. It's it's almost you can't hide from it, eh? Like athletes are extraordinarily good at compensating. That's that's one of the reasons yep. why they're great yep. athletes. But when you break down what they're doing and you say, okay, don't show me your 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 your, your turning sidekick. I want you to show me how much internal rotation your hip has, mm-hmm. and 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 I want you to you know feel what your hip can actually do. And you do you do a controlled articular rotation, which of course internet people are like, oh, it's just joint circles. It, it's not. <laughs> There's levels to this. So yeah. when you do controlled articular rotation, th- not only can you verbalize and cue the person as to what what's not happening, but they have no choice but to feel it. And once you take a pro athlete, and you're like, holy geez, man, I can't I can't even move my hip into the position that I know I'm supposed to in order to achieve this position that I'm trying to achieve. It, mm. It's it's almost like a, it's they, it's like they learn about themselves. Like they, you do cars and you get them to do cars, and and that maybe that w- we can call it the entry point of the system. And mm-hmm. people within themselves they start to realize what their capacities are, and then it's very easy to define what is needed from there. So I, I have really no problems with athlete buy-in. Like if yeah. if if when a pro athlete you know they fly out to see me and. You know, I'm like, okay, well, let's start at the beginning. You know, you know, you, you work, you work on your from your feet. Your feet have to communicate with the ground. Mm-hmm. And show show me what your foot can do. And they look down and they're like, oh my god, I can't even lift my toe yep. with yep. all of everything else moving. And it's like, well, you know, do you think you need good feet to 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 read the ground? And they're like, of course I do. And they're like, well, damn, let's start with your feet. And they're like, yeah, of course. Let's. It's not a. It's really not a difficult. It, there's no magic potions here, so you don't have to convince anybody of anything, which I think is why it's so easy to get that buy-in, which is a necessity for good training, of course. Man, you you probably understand it, but most people will be surprised, even though we you know we primarily do a lot of our stuff without shoes. A mm-hmm. lot of my fighters cannot isolate a big toe raise; like they have no control over it whatsoever. It's like everything just kind of moves together, or it doesn't move at all. And you know that that kind of goes into like proper movement patterns. If you can't do that, and 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 to be honest, and I hate to downgrade my guys because they know I love them, but um, you know a lot of people are like, how's it how's it like working with such amazing athletes? And these guys are not particularly, you know, I guess a hundred percent athletic in a sense. You know, a lot of them will will trip over their own shoes if you know, or trip over their own untied laces. You know, if they run too fast, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you know what? It, it's not it's just bad, I mean, I've had the privilege of working with with the highest level of of, of athlete in various sports, and mm. I mean, they, they've they've honed their body into doing this these specific tasks, sure. yeah. and they get amazing at doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and and you kind of it walls the body into certain you know ways of moving, and and you're exactly. it, you're stuck in that path. Yeah. And, and to a certain extent, you have to be. But if you if you really study, if you actually study movement creation and and what you know, what the the the, the experts in 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 this field are looking at, they're looking at something what's called dynamic systems theory, mm-hmm. which which if you if you want to roll it up into a into a ball, it's pretty much saying 
that every time you move, the, the thing that separates a good mover from a bad mover is their ability to deal with variables. And, and you know, something like, you know, fighting. There's a lot of variables coming at you. So if you're, if you're walled off into a very particular pattern, you mm. might have an amazing low kick when you, when you throw it from a, a good position. But mm. if, you, if you're touched off balance, you know, if you don't have the degrees of freedom to deal with the variables, mm. then you're, you're, you're shit out of luck. And, and yeah. that's another thing that, I mean, going back to the toe, if, if, you, if you ask a fighter, like, let's think about this. Like, I've been, I, I mean, I pride myself on, on, on being a pretty damn good, good kicker. I, I mean, if you can't, com if your foot doesn't have the capacity to speak to the ground, it, it, you can practice that kick a billion times. It's not, it's not going to go well for you, man. Like, yeah. you, if you look at your toe and you say, hey, man, just raise your toe. And people often look down at their foot and they look at it like it's an alien or some kind mm -hmm. of object. I mean, that, that's not acceptable for a fighter. It, you, you can't expect your foot to be able to alter position, you know, uh, stabilize, um, you know, take uh, potential force from the ground and turn it into kinetic force and do so while another human being is, is, is firing off shots at you. I mean, you, your, your toe has to be able to raise when you want it to raise. You have to have control in mm. to effectively execute anything under control. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Um, now, Jay, I wanted to get this you know, question out just because I kind of wanted to understand it. But as far as passive stretching before skills training, like, such as like BJJ rolling, sparring, wrestling, things like that, do you feel it's necessary or should we focus on full range of motion, active mobility and dynamic warm ups before training? And uh, and what do you feel is best overall or is it is it just subjective to the individual or for the matter? The good news is that I don't have to tell you what I feel because we, we, we kind of have answers to these questions, right? Mm -hmm. in, in, in research, right? We don't it's not it's not it's not a hundred percent clear, but there's enough of it that we can make some pretty darn good conclusions. Mm -hmm. And and Let's start with let's start with um, how does an injury occur? An injury can can really boil down to a mathematical equation, right? If the if the, the load going into a tissue exceeds the load bearing capacity of the tissue, then the tissue will yield under the load. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we know about passive stretching? It temporarily decreases your force absorption capacity. True. So when you're statically stretching before a roll. What you're doing is, whatever you're stretching, you're saying, you're, you're pretty much saying, I want you to be able to accept less load, mm -hmm. which is another way of saying, I want, I, I want to increase the chance that you're going to injure. Mm -hmm. So that's why when you look at static stretching and you look at does it prevent injuries, I mean, the research at this point, I mean, of course, you know, whatever is right today might be wrong tomorrow, but at this point, yeah. it's pretty clear that it's not going to prevent you from injuring yourself. Yeah. What would be a better focus is, can you, you know, can you warm up the nervous system in such a way that it can reactively take more force in 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 more variable force applications, which which it, when movement is so chaotic mm -hmm. that to be so I 100% agree. You need a dynamic warm up in order to if you, if your goal is to try to decrease the chances of hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. in training now <laughs> does that mean that you shouldn't stretch well that's that no that's that's a horrible uh, conclusion if you actually read the literature because mm -hmm. at other times it's it's a hundred percent necessary to stretch and 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 to um you know i don't do anything passively as you know mm -hmm. our stretching involves stretching with strengthening in com in combination in very specific ways which mm -hmm. which is the best in my opinion to, to number one become more flexible and number two to increase load absorption capacity in your flexibility so for a warm-up the answer would be well it, no it's not going to decrease your chance of injury now if you're a hockey goalie and you need to get into a split and you're about to play and that's a necessity for your job or you know you need you want to throw head kicks and and you know unless you you stretch out you can't throw head kicks well yeah sure go ahead and stretch to the extent that you need but i would mm -hmm. tell you that you should spend more time working on your mobility which would provide you those ranges of motion all the time instead of having to foam roll or or sit in the splits like 
if you, if you, not that this is ever going to happen, because this would probably be a weird scenario, but if you were ever, you know, you watch me roll out of bed, I mean, I can roll out of bed and kick you in the head. I can roll out of bed and drop into it in whatever position you want. Now, why? It's because I don't have to sit in an hour and a half long yoga class and warm my tissues and smash them into a foam roller and temporarily mm. deaden the receptors in order to express movement. I train my nervous system to own my movements. Gotcha. So from a warm-up standpoint, no, you want more dynamic warm-up and then past that, it's not to say that stretching is inherently bad, but there are better, more logical ways to achieve what you're actually looking for. And I'll tell you right now, man, people think they want to be flexible. That's just because they don't really have a clear definition as to, they think yeah. they want flexible, but what they really want is more control. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's, there's a big misconception between flexibility and mobility, and that's, that's a lot of it. What I even with my own, you know, private training clients, my, my general public is, you know, I just try to harp on more, you know, active range of motion than anything because they're gonna need that more so than, than anything in their everyday life, you know. So. Yeah, agreed. One hundred percent. And that, I'm glad you cleared that up because there is a lot of misconceptions from you just old school, you know, boxing and and, and you know karate, you know karate oh, style and just sure. just you know sitting in splits and butterflies and things like that. So I'm glad you cleared that up, and I'm hoping that every fighter in here listens to that and and takes it into account. Um, now I am, like I said before, I am gonna go do that Kinstret certification in a, in a few weeks. Um, can you talk about what kin stretch is and why it's better, in my opinion, than yoga? Well, just first of all, you said that I didn't because I don't, <laughs> I don't need my I don't need my social media inundated with angry, flexible people. <laughs> I mean, kin stretch is the application of the scientific principles that I used in the development of you know, functional range release, functional range conditioning, functional range assessment, but it's it's the application of it in the, with the ability to do it in a group setting, and it's it's a body practice. I think that all athletes, all humans, all athletes, no matter what you do, you wanna be a good hockey player, you wanna be a good basketball player, you have to practice your body. There has to be some component of your training which is a body practice. Now. Uh, something like yoga is a body practice. Uh, there, there's different types of body practices. Um, but if if we want to discuss whether or not the different types of body practices adhere to the, the 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 laws or the knowledge that is that is freely available in science, that's where I'm gonna I'm, we're gonna have we're gonna have a problem. So kin stretch is, is saying. <clears throat> so Phil, I'm I'm taking you through a kin stretch class. Kin stretch is saying. Okay, Phil, I want you to practice Phil's shoulder. And I want you to practice Phil's shoulder in various ways in order to maintain the, 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 the neurological control, maintain the mobility, the capacity for it to move. And then I want you to practice your shoulder in conjunction with your hip and your hip in conjunction with your knee. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really a system of training Phil's body parts in order to work better individually and then to work better together. Now, again, there's a, I mean, people take this and, you know, people just go crazy on social media. They're like, oh, he's, he's crapping on yoga. I am, I am 100% not. <laughs> when, you, when you get better at holding a particular pose, what you're getting better at is holding that particular pose. And if that's your goal, if you, if that, then then by all means, I, I like who am I to tell you what what to do with your body, right? But if you want your shoulder to be able to move in a multitude of different directions and to be able to accept or or to adapt to variables on in in real live time, then the principles they they don't match the science. So kin stretch is a body practice. Going back to bioflow, okay, let's give an example. You go to bioflow. Somebody might say, what's the best stretch for your adductors? Well, the first question is, what the hell do you mean by your adductors? There, there's, there's several different adductors, and every single adductor, every single muscle fiber in, in the adductor longus is within its own right, its own muscle. So there is no the best stretch for your adductor. If someone says you have to stretch in this direction, and I'm like, well, can I stretch in this direction? No, you must go this way. Well, why do I have to go that way? Well, because that's the position I want you in. 
that, that person is not understanding the three-dimensional nature of the human body. Mm-hmm. And, and if you're if you're using principles that that are two-dimensional, like people will come by and they'll you, in a stretch they'll correct the way you're stretching, and I'll be like, well, no, I feel it in the targeted tissue more if I internally rotate my hip in this position, and the person beside me feels it more when they're in a slight external rotation. Well, who's right? I don't know, man. I wasn't born with the damn stretching, you know instructional manual and I don't know who was but what I do know is the body has to be spoken to and and, and in the way that it, it understands and kin stretch is a way of training your body in a way that that is scientifically relevant and that takes into account a lot of things that that science tells us about what should I do to my what I, I fix your shoulder with FRC well how do you keep that shoulder working well well, you practice shoulder several times a week. So, and that's what kin stretch is. It's like, uh, it's, it's uh, in my mind, it's, it's a body practice which is enhanced by the injection of science. And, and it's, and I can't think of a better way to practice, you know, my body more than, than challenging it in multi directions with multiple different, different ways that, 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 that increase load absorption capacity mm-hmm. and increase capsular health, which then increases afferent feedback to the brain, which increases motor output. I mean, it, 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 so it's, it's an advanced body practice is what it is. Awesome. I mean, I, I don't have any more questions. Uh, you answer them on various levels. I have one question, though, from a listener, uh, Neil Benega Sabe. Uh, he asks, for athletes, how important is pre- or post-workout stretching? Also, how often and under what circumstances should athletes get chiropractic work done? Oh, man. Now you're going you're gonna to change my inbox from angry, flexible people to, <laughs> to angry people addicted to cracks and cracking. <laughs> okay, so I'm a, I'm a chiropractor, right? Um, what does that mean? It means that I studied uh, in a school of chiropractic. Now, when, when an athlete comes to me and, and, and they need something, it doesn't matter what I am. It, what I am doesn't change what they need. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whether if I'm standing next to a physiotherapist who's standing next to a massage therapist who's standing next to a medical doctor, and I'm standing in front of a professional athlete, what the athlete needs at that particular time is really independent of what the profession is. So when you say how often do you need to get chiropractic, it depends. When when someone comes to see me, uh, the traditional sense of manipulating joints. I mean, I have very specific reasons to manipulate joints, and if those reasons are not present, I am just as happy not to, and I'm just as happy to bring them onto the gym floor and start training their tissue with internal loading or or training. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes they require manual inputs like soft tissue. Sometimes they require, you know, uh, sometimes they do require manipulation. Sometimes they require mobilization. So it's, it's not a question I can answer unless you give me a client and and you allow me to 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 determine what they need. I, it's it's a crappy answer, I know. But do I think that someone needs to, you know, randomly go and have their all of their joints cracked on a regular basis? I don't think. No, I don't think it's necessary. I've I've been practicing chiropractic for a long time. Mm. I've worked at you know I've worked from uh, you know post surgical patients to people with motor neuron diseases to uh, to amateur athletes to professional athletes. I, I, I I'm doing a pretty good job. I think, I mean, who knows, but I, I think, and, and I, I don't know, I don't do that. I, it's just not something that I do. I'm not going to sit here and tell other professionals how to practice, mm-hmm. but I have, I have a set of, you know, when I assess someone, my job is to try to find out what the client in front of me needs right now and to provide them that. And it doesn't matter what my, my profession is, what the client needs is what they need. So mm-hmm. if you have a chronic problem with the articulation and and you need you know more inputs into there then you you'll need it more but if if your joint is functioning well then you can probably do better with spending more time on the gym floor or even with a chiropractor who is going to take you and teach you how to maintain what you have did that answer at least part of that question yes oh yes okay so i think the other part was about stretching what was the, what was it exactly it, uh, how important is pre or post workout stretching? Okay, so pre workout stretching, we kind of covered that. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, if your goal is to prevent injuries, you're 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 not doing, you're you're, you're not doing that. It's 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 not it's not going to be the way to do it. Uh, Post workout stretching. Again, I don't. I never stretch independent. Like I never only statically stretch. I always say if you want active results, you cannot rely on passive inputs. Mm-hmm. Passive inputs give you passive results. Active inputs give you active results. Says who? Says science. The law of specificity, which is one of the most well-studied physiological principles, is very, very clear on this, yeah? So I, I don't spend a lot of time just passively stretching after training. I will spend time with pails and rails inputs. I will spend time with, with uh, which which I, I know people might not know what that is, but it's it's the combination of stretching with, with uh end range strengthening with uh, cars and, you know, articular pumping and mobility work and, and, and different ways of, of improving control. But if you're asking me how much do I tell my pro athletes, how long do I tell them to statically stretch after or before training? I, I almost never tell them to only statically stretch. Hmm. And that's that's the most accurate answer I can give. Hmm. All right. I mean, that's all of our questions now uh, before we go. Uh, for the people that aren't following you yet, could you give them your Twitter, your social media, the Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever you're on? I mean, also, as I mentioned before, functionalanatomyseminars.com is you know, where they can go to get more information. Uh, also, let them know your YouTube page so they can watch all those amazing videos you have, too. Uh, yeah, my uh, my Twitter and my Instagram hand- handles are at Dr. Andre Ospina. Um uh, functional anatomy seminars.com or functional range systems.com uh, uh, will get you to the website kinstretch.com as well if that's if that's more your interest um, I, I believe it's youtube.com uh, slash dr andreo spina or andreo spina um, that'll that'll do it as well I, I i would i would also recommend you kind of uh, find out who my instructors are and follow them because we do we do pull out put out as much social media content that, 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 you know, learning content that, that would, would help people, um, you know, start this process. I'll always say that you can't learn much off, off Instagram, but if you can learn anything, we try our best to give information. So, uh, at Dr. Andreo Spina or Twitter and Instagram. And then those are the websites that I just mentioned. Nice. All right, Phil, as always your social. Uh, Instagram and Twitter is at Daru Strong. You can check me out on my YouTube now with at Phil Daru. Um, and then my website is www.darustrong.com. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me, phil at darustrong.com. Uh, as always, remember, you can listen to all of our episodes and on Breaking Muscle uh, at Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Player FM, Google Play Music. Also, you can find us on Facebook at Fight Strength Podcast and on Twitter at Fight Strength underscore. You know, send us a, sh- a share our show, send us a message, comment, rating, whatever you want. And thank you again. Big, big thank you to you, Dre. I mean, thorough information, fascinating yeah. stuff. Really, really appreciate it. I know you're a busy guy. Really appreciate you coming on the show with us this week. No, I appreciated the chat, guys. Uh, anytime. That was awesome. Thank you. No All worries. Right. That is it. I am Jason Burgos. He is Phil Drew. Until next time, everybody. Bye bye.